This is part one of two of our symposium with Cat Duff. Welcome to Sky Blue Symposia, a convivial gathering for stimulating conversation and a free exchange of ideas. Today we have Kat Duff, author of The Alchemy of Illness, joining us for our symposium. We're so glad to have you with us today, Kat. Welcome. Thank you very much. I'm so glad to be here. Great. And I'm Susan. I will be hosting, and our roundtable today consists of Lenny, Chipper Dog and Sabelle. And uh, actually, Chipper Dog has the first question for you, Kat. Okay. Hi, Kat. I was, I'm very curious, how did you come to write The Alchemy of Illness? Could you tell us a little bit about your background? Sure. The immediate uh, motivator for writing the book was that I got very sick, and being a bibliophile who Whenever I have any problem in my life, I turn to books for help, and uh, I couldn't find the kind of help I wanted in any book that I could find. I do have a writing background. I had one of those um, wicked English teachers in high school who, you know, sent back the paper covered with red over and over and over. (laughs) Through college, I wrote, and as an adult, I had put out a newsletter, a monthly newsletter, for many years as a writing practice just to get myself kind of smooth with writing. But I wasn't writing at the time I got sick. But as I said, I I couldn't find a book that could reflect back to me the experience I was having, not just in terms of the specifics of my illness, but in terms of the sense I had early on that there was something important about being sick, that something was trying to happen in my life uh, that was of value. And uh, everything I would look at about illness or sickness or disease was all about how it was a problem or a failure to be overcome. So that's why I started uh, really uh, jotting down little notes because uh, I couldn't even in the beginning when I was so sick it was hard to sustain a thought to, you know, through an entire sentence or an entire paragraph. But I started jotting these notes down, just kind of images and senses and uh, of what was going on. And in the course of a year, turned it into an essay that I shared with friends to try to communicate some. And they said, this is really interesting. Uh, it's hard to follow. You ought <laughs> you to know, write a book. Said, spread it out a little bit, you know, (laughs) and you jump really fast, you know. So that's how it came into being. That sounds just really, really interesting. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Kat, um, this is Lenny, and I'm wondering if you could speak to uh, these two ideas. One is the body knows more than we do, as well as the other, which is um, the body does not know what is best for us. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay, the body knows uh, more than we do. That uh, is a little easier for me to respond to and that my experience has been that oftentimes I, my body shows me something that I hadn't remembered, hadn't realized before. Uh, it can be something as simple as I've been so busy I haven't eaten all day and my body says, wait a minute, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, <laughs> you know, eat. Uh, There are the very basic things like that that our bodies will remind and tell us to do. But also, you know, the whole tide of our experiences as they wash over us, you know, minute by minute, uh, month by month, year by year. It's more than we can uh, really kind of contain and retain in our conscious awareness. But somewhere in our bodies or in our body psyches and, and... Uh, I sometimes have a hard time telling the difference between the two. 
a lot of that experience is still there. I have found that dreams will uh, access memories that I had forgotten or give me information in a bigger picture than I had known. I think of dreams as kind of coming from our bodies and psyches, uh, at least from traces of past experiences that are still held somehow in our nervous systems and uh, kind of re-triggered and, and relived and uh, reorganized a little bit in our dreams. So in that way, I will often feel like my body knows more than I do. Uh, however, and this is your second question, uh, the body does not know what is best for us. I don't know if anybody knows what's best for us. <laughs> um, and I certainly wouldn't just rely on my body body as uh, a guide. Uh, I, um, I, I, in fact, the very question of what, what's best for us, uh, even when I make my prayers, I have learned not to pray for anything in particular because particulars oftentimes turn out to be just what I didn't really need in retrospect. Uh, so I will pray for the highest good of everyone concerned or everything involved. Because it's a, it's an open question for me as to what's best, and oftentimes that's not something that I can even assess until much later in life, looking back. And even then, maybe it's just a momentary thought. But certainly, uh, physical illness, as it is so physical, I know I had episodes uh, when I was sick of nausea and vomiting uh, that were not really a a part of the illness itself or a function of what I ate or didn't eat, uh, it was uh, clearly something very emotional that was trying to come out. Uh, in fact, I even had the experience once, I remember when I was laying in bed and feeling very nauseous, like I was about to throw up. And then I started remembering something and felt a wash of a strong emotion and felt really emotional for a few minutes. And while I was feeling that emotion, I didn't have the nausea. And I noticed that. And the minute I noticed that, I kind of dropped out of the emotion and the nausea was back. And I could literally feel it kind of translate uh, from the physical to the emotional and psychological and back in. Um, is that, does that answer your question? I know that was uh, kind of a long thought. Um, yes, it does. And, and it brought, up, brought to mind um, uh, a memory of mine, which was when I was roughed, which is like a very deep type of massage. Uh -huh. uh, I, uh, I had uh, ideas. I mean, things came to my, memories came to my mind. Pictures came to my mind of things that, that had happened that I had totally forgotten about, but my body stored that memory somewhere yes. uh, in there. Yes. Yes, and I've had that experience, too. Uh, I remember when I was working with a body worker, there was uh, a point on the inside of my knee that, you know, released a very specific memory uh, that I had uh, was later able to confirm, but I had no conscious recall of. So, yes, I, I think that yeah, our bodies are sort of like that larger pool of um, at least personal memory. And uh, given that we carry, you know, genes from our ancestors, I think there's to some extent some way in which our bodies carry deeper memories as well. Wow, that's a thought. Well, Kat, just to follow up on that, because I find that so interesting and uh I've come across it so many times in myself and with others. I think that, well, my experience is that sometimes these memories are not within our our consciousness. And I've seen t sometimes things go back several generations and doing body work or illness or something brings these things up. Is that how you, is that what you're referring to? Yes. I had an experience when I was sick with the chronic fatigue, which I, I wrote, I write about in the book, in which I had a dream uh, that the basement of my grandparents' house, they no longer lived in that house, but had been their house and was the house that my father had grown up in, had a big mural 
of uh, the Spanish conquistadors coming, you know, onto the American continent. Mm. It's a Spanish colonial uh, style house. Uh, and I had once heard that there was something painted on the walls downstairs in that house, but I didn't know what it was. Uh, in the dream, I had a very specific image, and uh, I later told it to my father, and he said, yes, that's what it is. And uh, that dream is what prompted me to look into my family's history, uh, and especially that side of the family, that'd be my father's side of the family. They, uh, my father's side of the family, my ancestors, my great, great, great grandfather came to Minnesota and we had been in Minnesota ever since. But the, uh, my father's ancestors, my ancestors on his side, had come to Minnesota shortly before it became a state uh, when it was still primarily inhabited by uh, Native American Dakota peoples, tribal peoples, as well as, um, you know, certain French and uh, English trappers. And shortly after they arrived, uh, the Sioux uprising occurred, or the uh, Dakota Sioux War, as it's now called, and to make a long story short, the native peoples were uh, kicked out of Minnesota. They were um, had been put onto smaller and smaller reservations and promised foods and annuities to support themselves since they no longer had their hunting grounds. And then when the food and annuities didn't show up, uh, they took some eggs here and a chicken there, and uh, that prompted a, a wholesale massacre, the largest massacre sanctioned by the U.S. government in U.S. history. And my great-great-great-grandfather was not a part of that. However, he was in real estate. And when that land was, in a sense, confiscated uh, from the Native peoples, uh, he quickly got it from the state and got large tracts of land for next to nothing and uh, began to sell them off. And uh, that it was, in fact, the land that I grew up on and that all my relatives were all around. My grandmother, my great aunt, my great uncle, everybody was all around on these tracts of land. So my goodness. I came to, uh, the dream and the illness prompted me to kind of pursue that history. And that in turn prompted me to go to a shaman, uh, who was the only kind of person I could think of to address these larger uh, ancestral lineages. Yes. And when I met with him, Martin Prechtel, one of the first things he said is, we would not say that you are sick. We would say that you are the open wound and carrying that wound so that others may live. Yes, I've uh, had that experience myself. And I know that a lot of other people have, um, especially here in, in Europe, I've I've discovered that uh, a lot of time things from even the First World War, Second World War, are coming through the generations. So it's really important that we're aware of these things and that sometimes it isn't just us. So yeah. I really appreciate that you've uh, spoken about this. Yeah. Um, on, on a little bit different track, you wrote in your book, Illness is the Shadow of Western Civilization, the Antithesis of the Rampant Extroversion and Productivity It So Values. I d it just blew me away because when I read that, would you expand on this shadow in regards to acts of will and effort and fixing and comparing ourselves to other? Hmm. Well, uh, yes, I was uh, raised uh, as you know, most of us are here, I think, in the States and, and, and in the West to um, achieve, to accomplish, to be busy. You know, if we ask someone how you're doing or ask an older person how they're doing, oh, keeping myself busy, you know. It was uh, so achievement focused that anything that uh, hampers or impedes or gets in the way of that achievement, that ongoing productivity uh, becomes a problem to be eliminated rather than uh, something to uh, learn from or just take in as another piece of information. Yeah. 
And so one of the hard things I think about getting sick in this culture is that you feel like a failure. Uh, you feel like you're just a drain on everybody because you aren't producing. Uh, you aren't busy. You aren't uh, up and at them and positive and on the go. And uh, in fact, your very existence at the very least is a drain on others who are, you know, caring for you uh, or at the worst, frightening to those yeah. who are on the go. Mm -hmm. I know I talk about there being kind of an invisible rope between the sick and the well uh, or that divides the two. And, and uh, now that I'm pretty much well, I find myself on the other side of that rope and I feel it as much there <laughs> as I did on the other side. Yes, I can appreciate that. Yes. Yeah. They're very different worlds, very different realities. Uh, I am happy to be well again, and I also worry that I uh, would stay well too long or too easily and um, uh, forget to do the kind of reflecting, the kind of downtime, the kind of quiet that illness requires of us as an antidote to those mm. uh, Western practices and ways. It's interesting, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking it's almost like a masculine, active, yang kind of expectation and illness could be, uh, you know, stillness and quiet non-productivity and a yin sort of aspect. So I'm wondering if illness could be an opportunity to challenge these uh, Western assumptions and expectations. I think so, especially when we allow our uh, experiences with the illness, whether they're small things like a, a flu that passes in a couple of days or, or longer things like uh, my chronic fatigue or even lifelong in terms of certain uh, chronic ailments, they, if we can be present in them, uh, do challenge many of those assumptions. Mm. There's a, yeah. a quote yeah. from Virginia Woolf that I love that I put in the book uh, that if you don't mind, I'll, I'll read. Is that okay? Please do. She says, in health, the general pretense must be kept up and the effort renewed to communicate, to civilize, to share, to cultivate the desert, to educate the native, to work together by day and by night to sport. In illness, this make-believe seizes. Mm. Mm. And part of what I love about that quote is that she's clearly uh, speaking from the side of the rope that the ill person's on because she views it as a kind of pretense. Yes. And also, wow. another thing that I love about it is that it um, associates that busyness and, and activity with the imperialist cultures of the West. So she says ah. that must be renewed to communicate, to civilize, to cultivate the desert, to educate the native. Uh, she associates it with that imperialistic ethos, which is the ethos that uh, illness is the antidote to. Sounds like music, actually. I'm, I'm, every time I encounter your thoughts and your work, it makes me reevaluate what is illness and what is health, actually. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. <laughs> well, I feel I the same way, actually. It's been a pleasure to come back to this book and read it again. And be reminded again, because uh, like I say, right now I'm, I'm on the other side of the rope. And so uh, I have found it valuable to come back to it. Thank you, Susan. Yes. Thank you, Kat. <laughs> so, Kat, my question is, what's the deal with Western medicine, which no longer seems to provide health care? Some say it is sick care because it focuses on managing symptoms of chronic diseases such as diabetes or heart disease versus actually going to the cause of them. Mm -hmm. How can someone who is stuck in that paradigm change their own mindset and use their illness to be their benefit? Huh. It's a good question. And um, it is tricky because allopathic or Western medicine has accomplished some wonderful things. 
uh, I think antibiotics are uh, some of the best things uh, Western medicine has to offer. A couple years ago, I broke both my hands and, and had surgery on my hands, and I'm able to use them again, and I found myself realizing that if I had lived 100 years ago, I probably would be crippled and not able to use those hands. Uh, and so there are valuable things about allopathic or Western medicine, but it does take that uh, almost an imperialistic kind of approach towards disease and illness, which is we are going to get rid of these symptoms. You know, we are going to eradicate them. Uh, and when I can get rid of a, a headache that is uh, so painful that I'm about uh, I'm nauseous, I'm happy for that, but uh, in the longer run, we do have to, I, li I like the line from Stephen Levine when he talks about we are not responsible for our illnesses, but we are responsible to them. That is, uh, uh, they have landed with us, they are consuming us for a period of time, and um, we could just keep railing against them and be mad at that and feel victimized um, and uh, not make things any better. Or we could say, and this is, of course, as a therapist, one thing I know that uh, anytime you can make any misfortune meaningful, uh, it becomes much more livable and oftentimes uh, less problematic altogether. And so uh, the search for meaning, the search for what gifts can be found in it uh, is a very valuable exercise, even while you can at the same time hold the notion that there is no ultimate meaning to the illness. Uh, the search for it has you looking down the alleys that are only yours to look down, that are... Uh, the threads that um, come together in the weaving that is you. And in doing that, you not only can write a book about it, <laughs> as I was able to do, but you can also um, claim it as your own, uh, respond to that illness, make it a part of your life in a way that uh, uh, enhances your life, enhances your relationship to the whole of things. Um, in terms of what is an individual to do in the face of Western medicine, which um, oftentimes doesn't help and oftentimes makes things worse, uh, in terms of any specific advice, uh, and what I try to follow is, um, to begin with, if I can hold with the symptom and see how it unfolds. Uh, see what it brings up for me, see what dreams it comes forward, see what emotions and feelings, see what it prompts me to do. Uh, if it's uh, terrible allergies to the cedar that's pollinating, as is happening right here in northern New Mexico, and it keeps me inside, then, well, what if I just follow through with that and do the things I can do inside? Um, you know, following the symptom, in a sense, uh, where it leads us, where it takes us. Uh, it makes it for a much more interesting ride and adventure. Uh, I loved that uh, quote from Margaret Evans, who, uh, an English woman who was uh, epileptic uh, in the, kind of the, the early part of the uh, 20th century. She said, our health is as a voyage and every illness is an adventure story. Um, that's kind of the approach I try to take then you can look to both allopathic as well as what are called alternative approaches to see what they can do to help unfold that set of symptoms or that illness, uh, to bring it more easily into the fabric of your life so that it doesn't feel like it's breaking you apart or tearing you apart or, or keeping you from whatever quality of being is important to you. Uh, and, you know, classically, what helps one person doesn't help another person. So uh, there's a trial and error process of whether it's uh, going to be a more Eastern uh, acupuncture approach or a more, uh, you know, whatever alternative, or a shamanistic approach or uh, uh, a more... Um, herbal approach, uh, a, a homeopathic approach. There's many alternatives to the allopathic approach. 
and um, they're all really valuable. And uh, I don't know whether it's different personalities work best with one method or another, or whether it's different symptoms of different diseases respond better to one or another. But it's an individual path that only, you know, that person can find and draw out from their experience with that symptom. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, we all have our own journeys, and part of the journey is being and not knowing and trying to find something. (laughs) Yes, it is. And, you know, the not knowing is a really valuable place to be. I had a uh, professor in graduate school who used to tell us whenever we realized we'd made a terrible mistake, oh, great, now you can learn something. (laughs) And really what he was saying was, now that you realize you don't know, now you can learn. When you thought you knew before, you were close to learning. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm-hmm. Kat, when you were talking about how we are responsible to our illness and finding the meaning in our illness, it made me think about um, there's some people who write about how illnesses uh, are symbols of what's going on inside. And so what are your thoughts about certain illnesses that match certain life issues, like a woman who is very nurturing in the extreme and she doesn't receive any nurturing in her life uh, from others, um, and she might get breast cancer, something like that. What are your thoughts about that? Mm-hmm. You know, I you're reminding me of Louise Hay's work, uh, which I'm certainly familiar with, and, and probably there's many others along those lines. Uh, I think there that meaning can be found in symptoms. I don't know whether a cookie cutter approach is valuable uh, or always appropriate. And by cookie cutter, I mean uh, breast cancer equals not receiving enough nurturing. (laughs) Um, Because we're so much more complex and individual than that. And I don't think Louise Hay or any others who talk about that are, are trying to impose cookie cutter approaches but I think more what they're trying to do is open our minds to the possibility that there's meaning um, I often find it valuable to consider you know I have a book like that I look in it sometimes and sometimes I go wow uh, that really makes sense to me and other times I go forget it and throw it on the floor <laughs> you know um, I get you know the individual is the one who can tell whether that sits and sinks uh, is valuable or not. Um, there are other approaches like Arnold Mendel's where uh, you really try to almost exaggerate the symptom in order to get it to speak to you. Um, and I have found that valuable at times as well. Uh, I think the important thing is that only the person who has the symptom is the one who can discern the meaning in it. Uh, that we can't from the other side of the rope, look at that person and go, oh, it's because such and such. Uh, And there's a danger in how those kind of uh, books or writings can be used uh, as ways to, in a sense, blame the victim. I I remember once when I was sick uh, and having to tell someone, you know, kind of a loose associate that I was sick and and she said, I've always thought you worked too hard. And that's not really a bad thing to say to someone, but it was uh, an immediate uh, assessment that I got sick because I worked too hard. Uh, And um, I may decide that's true, but no one else outside of me can really decide whether that's true or not. And when I hear that from someone, mostly what I hear is their fear of the symptom or illness that you embody. And when we need to say, oh, well, if they only ate this diet, if they only did this or didn't do that, it wouldn't be there. What we're saying is, well, I don't do that thing, so I won't get sick that way. Or I eat this way, so I won't have that happen to me. It's kind of a way of um, assuring ourselves that we won't be vulnerable to illness uh, or to that particular illness. Uh, And that's okay, but when it's said out loud to the person who is sick, it feels like a judgment or a put down or a blaming. So uh, those kinds of things have to be used very carefully and oh. uh, explored carefully. Oh, I, I, I so agree um, on many levels. I mean, with dream interpretation, it's the same thing. It's really yes. the it, what the person assigns to the meaning. 
And, you know, you brought up when you were talking about um, uh, people assigning, being judgmental about somebody having an illness. It's like the person seems to be responsible for, for their illness and they're judged like that. But uh, that's a really hard thing and might make the person who is ill feel like they have failed in some way. Mm-hmm. Um, that's um, true. Do you, do you have any more thoughts on that? Yeah. You know, um, even though I have been on the side of the rope of illness and felt judged in those ways and told myself I will never, ever do that again to anyone else, I find myself doing it. Um, even even when I was sick, uh, I remember noticing myself thinking. Fortunately, I didn't say it out loud. I have a friend with bad rheumatoid arthritis uh, and thinking, oh, if only she didn't eat so much sugar. <laughs> You know, and of course, the minute I thought it, I went, wait a minute, you know, what are you doing? Um, and uh, what uh, and what that made me realize is, yes, I may be sick with chronic fatigue, but I'm still afraid of something like arthritis, <laughs> you know, um, and we're all kind of on both sides of the rope in that way. Um, and so it's it's kind of a knee jerk response, I think, in I don't know how universal or how particular it is to our culture, but something to watch in ourselves. And it, it probably, I will have to watch it till the day I die in <laughs> myself, even having written about it, uh, because it's just uh, such a habit we have. So empathy might be a good response. Yes, yes. I remember, I remember hearing an interview with... Oh, boy, and I have forgotten her name now. She is a religious scholar who's written a lot about the Bible, wrote initially, became famous with her book, The Gnostic Gospels, Elaine Pagels. It was an interview with her years ago, uh, and she was uh, starting, she had been writing the book that she wrote about the uh, original garden story and the beginning of evil, and always with the question of why does Christianity have this notion that we are born with sin. Why would that be there? And as she was being interviewed, she said, you know, when I was working on this book, my son became sick with leukemia. And I found myself as a mother, she said, thinking, what did I do wrong? Uh, Did I do this? Did I not do that? What have I done wrong? It must be my fault. Um, And she said that what her experience was is that the helplessness of a mother not being able to help or heal uh, her son or to keep him from suffering or dying was so intolerable to her that she would rather assume guilt. (laughs) And I have found that such an instructive story in how quick we are to either assume guilt or project blame uh, that the experience of helplessness is so fundamentally painful. And, and uh, it makes me think of the existential therapy work you've done, Susan, uh, in terms of uh, it's so existentially intolerable that we leap so quickly, almost before we can think, into uh, trying to find a fault somewhere because the helplessness and just sitting with that helplessness is hard. So sitting with, uh, when you're sick, the helplessness of not being able to make yourself well as well as loving someone who is sick and not being able to make them well. Uh, There's a lot of helplessness in the terrain in and around illness that is uh, a a major existential issue that we as human beings uh, have to come to terms with. Absolutely. Wow. Kat, I was uh, thinking earlier that, um, at least in the Buddhist tradition, that illness is seen as an opportunity to deepen one's spiritual practice. And I think that reflects exactly what you've been speaking of. Yes, yes. Uh, and I think it's uh, kind of demonstrative of our uh, Western arrogance that we tend to assume health and well-being and are shocked and appalled when uh, we don't have that nonstop. Uh, whereas the Buddhist notion is to expect and understand and expect that life is suffering. There's suffering in it. Uh, There's illness. There's death. There's, uh, you know, a lot of hardship. Uh, And uh, also in that Buddhist understanding is the notion that everything that 
happens to us in life has very deep roots in past lives, in what might be called karma, whether it's individual or familial or collective, uh, that uh, so that when we are experiencing that uh, mishap or illness or disaster or whatever you want to call it that feels bad, it's understood to be the ripening of a karma. It's the making right of something that was done wrong long before. Uh, and so in that sense, uh, from that strictly Buddhist understanding, it's actually good karma to have that karma ripening, to have the suffering being endured so that we will no longer make a mistake like that and that we can kind of clear that out of our personal and familial and ancestral lines. Mm, so true. Thank you, Kat. Kat, mm-hmm. yeah, this is Sabella again. So how do you think our culture supports illness? You know, what are the benefits of illness? Like maybe someone gets more attention or there's some reasons actually to be sick in our culture. So Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have an elderly friend in her uh, mid 80s. And she is uh, lives alone, has never married, doesn't have any children, actually doesn't have any relatives at all. Um, and uh, she had a heart attack uh, about 15 years ago. Since then, she's been carefully monitored. Uh, but she gets, uh, oh, every couple of months, she charges over to the emergency room. Uh, because she's having uh, something going on in her body that's frightening her and she's afraid it's a heart attack. And this last time I was with her and I said, let's just try and be with it for a while and see, you know, how it goes. But it didn't get better after an hour or two. And so I took her to the ER and we went into the emergency room and the doctor said, you know, have you ever felt this way before? Uh, And she said, lots of times. I felt this way many, many times. (laughs) And the doctor said, well, what did you do that made it better? And she said, well, I came here. What else? (laughs) Um, And uh, he kind of chuckled and and he said, oh, I wish we could bottle that uh, magic. Um, And really what she needed was a level of attention and assurance uh, and reassurance uh, that having no primary others around her to reflect back to her, to uh, kind of ground her when she was starting to wig out. She uh, resorted to the emergency room, and the emergency room worked very well. And I remember saying to her one time, I said, well, how about we try urgent care rather than the ER, the ER being much more expensive. And um, she said, oh, no, they know me over at the ER. I know them. Uh, uh, I don't want to go to strangers. Uh, They had become like family in a sense. Uh, for her and we're capable of reassuring like no one else Uh, and so certainly there is that kind of um, comfort and assurance that many get from the medical profession uh, that many get from you know being tested to see if it is a strep (laughs) you know having the test uh, to find out if the cancer has spread or not you know those things can be very reassuring Uh, in my experience in terms of the classic secondary gain of uh, extra attention, I find that kind of limited in the sense that in my experience, not just personally, but in watching others around me, getting sick gets you attention and help for a little while and then pretty soon people disappear. And so I don't think that secondary gain lasts very well. Uh, It could possibly, if you were able to get a lighter workload or go on to part-time work rather than full-time or if um, you were able to qualify for disability or something like that. But uh, mostly uh, what people who've been sick tell me is that um, the tension fades pretty quickly and then you're on your own. Uh, So I think that the secondary gain, if there is, would be primarily be the attention and the reassurance. And I think also, now that I think about it, also um, having uh, uh, the demands lessened a little bit 
I know uh, when I was sick, there was no way I could go to birthday parties, for example, or, or movies or things like that. Uh, as I got better, uh, I started feeling kind of torn. I had limited energy. I could go to that birthday party, but it meant I couldn't do anything else that day. And uh, it was a little hard because I no longer had my illness as an excuse to not go. I couldn't say, I'm sick, I'm sorry, I can't come. And uh, so I guess that was a kind of secondary gain uh, that um, myself and others, uh, knowing I was sick, would uh, lessen the demands on me. And as I got better, the demands came back on. Uh, but... Um, most people I know would would uh, rather have the demands than the illness, <laughs> so uh, I can't say that the secondary gain is that valuable. Yeah, it's it's like short term bonding, which is nice, but then that that um, that mechanism breaks down quite quickly. <laughs> yes, it does. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. So, what do you think about? Um, now there's so many people that have gone on to disability because they can't get jobs and now they have to identify as being an ill person in order to keep their income. Oh my gosh. I know I've been through that with, with friends and clients and, and uh, I, I feel so fortunate that I didn't have to go on to disability. And uh, that is some, um, and I don't know what, can be done about it because uh, you end up, I, when I was sick, I certainly ended up I identified as sick and it took me a long time to kind of grow out of that uh, because our support systems are so uh, weak and, and um, I, I think of a net that has a lot of holes in it, <laughs> you know, uh, if we, we have support for the uh, very disabled. If you're totally disabled, then you can go on disability and you can be uh, get that support. But there isn't a kind of interim support uh, for, for example, for people who could work part time but can't work full time. Uh, you know, that's not available. And uh, so it's kind of an either or thing. Um, and there's not that much room for getting better. It's like you get on disability and you're expected to be ill for the rest of your life yeah you know yeah. Your, your back is permanently bad your your diabetes is permanently bad or whatever and there's no yeah. there's no room for getting well and if you get well now you have no money exactly you have no money and you have uh, a period of time when you've been out of the workforce you're older uh, you're probably less familiar with technological advances, you're, it's going to be harder to find work. Uh, certainly if people get disability for more psychological things like post-traumatic stress, I've certainly had friends and, and clients who um, have uh, gotten better enough that they went off disability and went back to work, um, but it's a very um, difficult process and like I say, there's no way to be carried in the interim unless you have friends and family who can somehow carry you along. Uh, just as going on disability is not easy. Uh, here in New Mexico, it's a good three and a half years from your application to your hearing, and that's the first hearing. And uh, you cannot make a penny in the meantime. So you basically have to be either have money saved, which usually by the time people are applying for disability, they don't have much left, uh, or you have to have people who can carry you for a chunk of time and that's um, uh, because we uh, you know have such uh, fragmented family systems most people or a lot of people don't have that available to them yeah it's it's kind of scary here it's it's two years and two rejections to get disability mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's I mean I've seen people with broken backs oh I know <laughs> you know it's like really they can't roll out of bed, literally. <laughs> you know? I know. My brother, who worked in the disability field, knew someone who had um, been paralyzed and become a quadriplegic who was turned down the first time. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of scary. Yeah. Well, thank you. Yes.
Kat, this is Chipper again. And hey. what I was, I've been hearing is you, it sounds like the manner in which medicine is approached by the allopathic mind and the productivity approach of the social mind are very, very similar. And mm -hmm. that it neither one of them seems to account for the individual in a whole awareness sort of way. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting thought. Um, uh, thanks for sharing that, Chipper. It's a nice analogy. Uh, and, you know, I had just been thinking, oh, I would love to hear some of what y'all's thoughts are on some of these questions you're asking. Uh, but, um, yeah, I think that um, what allopathic, I mean, what that American ethos of uh, productivity and allopathic medicine have in common is that they're very results-oriented. They're very oriented towards the physical realm physical cause, physical effect, uh, and the other dimensions of things, because they can't be kind of seen under a microscope, right. are not considered valid or even real. Uh, and so it does, um, it's a very, uh, very single focused point of view and has remarkable a achievements in that single focus, uh, but leaves out so much that is a part of who we are and, and what holds the world together. Right. It's always seemed like allopathic medicine to me is is at its best in a trauma uh, arrangement. I mean, yes. when, when there is trauma, they can repair broken hands, they can repair broken legs or, mm -hmm. or livers or whatever. Yes. But, it's excellent in that. But they, they don't tie the reason that hands got broke or that legs got broke or that livers went south you know they they don't bring that into awareness or or allow that to come into awareness because it doesn't fit with that paradigm with that uh, right. that mindset it's true it's and true I, i'm wondering if that might also connect into western civilizations and and scientific materialism well, yes, the scientific materialism would be the basis that both of those grew out of, I would say, um, the productivity ethos and the allopathic medicine. And uh, I had an interesting experience, uh, I guess it was maybe 50, 15 years or so after I got sick with chronic fatigue and that kind of dominated a, a decade of my life and then I got much better and then I developed breast cancer and uh, I went through treatment for that. Um, and having done that, I can say wholeheartedly that uh, I much prefer to have cancer than chronic fatigue. Um, the reason being that cancer was recognized and detectable in allopathic medicine. As a result, I had enormous social and physical support. My insurance paid for all those doctor visits, all those tests, all those surgeries. Uh, People came out of the woodwork to deliver food and things like that. It was just so socially recognized because they could see cancer cells, whereas they they still can't see the mechanism of chronic fatigue. And that's another manifestation of that scientific materialism. Yeah. The, the uh, externalization and the objectification of the, that state of consciousness, it seems like, would work very well with the allopathic mind and the, the mm. patriarchal mind. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I am thankful that they exist because, uh, you know, I'm cancer-free now and going on with my life. Yeah. Um, my hands work. As I say, I don't want to, uh, but it's just limited. And, and that's my biggest complaint, I would have to say, about scientists because I love science in a lot of ways. But when scientists say something doesn't exist because they haven't been able to detect it yet that's the part that bothers me if they could right. just humbly say we haven't found that yet <laughs> you know or we don't know yet yeah. we just don't know uh i would be very happy i think that's coming i just read an article about nanotechnology and one of the comments in the in the article is the way it changes the way that you perceive every object around you. Instead of a table being solid, it's a bunch of molecules whose electrons are 
sloshing around. And uh. and to me, that is such a, a validation, I guess, of the energetic world and, and its, to me, its primacy over the objectified. Oh, I know. I remember very clearly the day in when I was in college and I learned about the wave particle stuff in physics and I put my hand on the wall and said this feels solid but it it could just be a bunch of waves if I look at it in a different way <laughs> you know, it's kind of like something you would uh, you know take some uh, kind of drug to realize but uh, it, it's it's striking when you think about it your own that, personal and that's, slit experiment <laughs> exactly and of course it's a very Buddhist notion too you know that things we think are real are not solid. They are not permanent. They are. They're just passing collections of energy fields. You know. Yeah. Fascinating. Yes, it is. It is. Thanks, Chipper Dog. Thank you. This concludes part one of two of our symposium with Cat Duff. <laughs> <laughs>